Almighty God. Again, so glad to have the Urshans in the house tonight. I want Brother Urshan to come and whatever the Holy Ghost has told him, I want him to tell us tonight. Would you please extend your hand toward him and pray for the house, the family, the ministry, the church back home. Just pray God's anointing and blessing on all that he does. Would you pray for him? Come on, lift up a loud voice and pray for him. Pray for him with an anointing and pray for him seriously tonight. Come on. Ah, hallelujah. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Let's continue to worship the Lord right now. Let's continue to worship him. Let's continue this beautiful atmosphere that's in this place. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we worship you. Lord, we bring our praise to you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. All praise be unto the name of the Lord. God is great. Somebody needs to learn how to proclaim it. God is great. One prophet said, lift up your voice like a trumpet. God is great. There, right there. Let that go in Jesus' name. Lift up your voice. Hey, out of us. Yes, 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 yes. My, 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 my. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Woo, I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. Amen. How many can feel the presence of the Lord in this place? Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. There's miracle working power here. Hallelujah. There is sin breaking power. Hallelujah. There is liberty. Don't have to leave the same way we came in. God can break bitterness just like that. People that torment themselves with things that happened years ago, God can break it just like that. Amen. Amen. The Bible says wise men came to see Jesus. And when they came to see him, they were bringing gold, uh, gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And they came and they spoke to Herod. And Herod said, when you find him, let me know where he's at so I can worship him. And they went, they found the babe, the Bible says, and they worshiped him. And being warned by an angel that things were not what they seemed, the Bible says they left a different way. Hallelujah. You don't have to leave the same way you came in. When you encounter Jesus, the way you go out is not going to be the same way you came in. So make up in your mind, I'm going to get to Jesus. I'm going to touch him tonight. I'm going to bring my gift. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. What a beautiful spirit. What a, what a precious assembly. It's wonderful to be here with Pastor Sutton, with his family. Uh, what a wonderful family. I hope the Life Church knows how blessed they are. Because great leadership is something to be very, very thankful for. It is not everywhere. So it is something to be thankful for. And you can feel the spirit of worship. You can feel the vision of this church. And it's our privilege to be here with you this weekend. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to open up with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And I'm going to begin reading at verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3. If you have it, say amen. Paul told the church at Corinth, he said, For though we walk in the flesh... We do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. Somebody say through God. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations 
and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought oh hallelujah every thought to the obedience of Christ praise be unto we serve a great and living God amen I can't help it how the world does it and I don't want to do it like the world does it and I don't want to do it like I used to do it I want to do it live life overcome be strong raise my family have church I want to do it the way God's people do it so tonight by the help of the Lord I want to talk to you for a few moments on a subject I'll entitle the weapons of our warfare the weapons of our warfare God bless you you can be seated There is that about the things of God that go against the grain of the flesh. If you are in your flesh, you are going to not just struggle to do things spiritually or to see things spiritually, but it will actually be impossible for you to see things spiritually. Paul told the church in his first epistle, it said that the carnal man cannot know the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. Uh, I don't know why God chose the model that he chose when he decided to make a people. But when he did, he chose a certain model. When he looked down on the world and he decided to have a people, he could have chose any kind of a model. He could have chose the victorious, strong, powerful, dynamic personality, the conquering king. He could have chosen that model. Lord knows People of this world like that model. The Jews thought they were going to get that model. <laughs> and yet when their king came, he came loping, shuffling, hopping down the road on a donkey. When he chose his men, he didn't choose them for their height. Or their breadth of shoulder. Or their sparkling intelligence. He didn't choose them because they were the wealthiest. He told his people in one place, he said, I didn't choose you because you were the greatest. I chose you because you were the least. God has a reason for everything that he does. And it's significant that Paul said in this scripture... That the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God. It's going to have to be through God if it's going to accomplish anything. I'm not fighting the warfare of this world. I'm not fighting this world's battles. I, I've chosen to invest my energies in God's battles. Praise the Lord. I don't have time to argue with my neighbor. I don't have time to get mad at the person across the building. I don't have time to cross my arms and mutter under my breath and hold grudges for years. I don't have time to talk about people behind their backs. That's the warfare of this world. Amen. I, I, there's, there's far too much sin in this world to be overcome for me to waste my time fighting a physical carnal battle well don't you know what they said about you brother Ursha? i don't care i've got somebody that needs a bible study well aren't you going to respond i'll respond but i'm not going to respond like you think i'm not going to come back with sarcasm i'm not going to backbite literally to bite back 
but I'm going to make the devil really mad. I'm going to hit him where it really hurts. I'm going to worship like I never worshiped before. I'm going to go out and win five more souls to the kingdom of God. I'm going to spend another day out in the streets knocking on doors and giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. to You want to make the devil mad? Hit him where it hurts. Amen. I, this, this is the way we fight. People who waste time fighting each other and fighting this world's battles and trying to chase down their enemy, to chase down every loose gossiping thing, to chase down every loose tale about themselves, to try to get back everybody that ever hurt them. First of all, they're going to have a very busy life. (laughs) But second of all, when we are involved in something so great and something so momentous, I I tried to put it on a... uh, I tried to put it in terms the church back home could understand. I said, you know, it would be like fighting the most famous, life-changing, national battle that we know of and not getting involved in it. Imagine yourself there on D-Day, storming the beaches of Normandy. And boats are pulling up, soldiers are piling out. Uh, Germans are shooting and trying to hold their position and allied forces are storming the beaches and it's students hear about it. Teachers teach about it. Hollywood dramatizes it a a turning point in American freedom and a, a fighting against fascism and evils that had overtaken the world, a crowning point in history. And imagine being right in the middle of that battle and being in the kitchen fighting over the last biscuit with your neighbor. I don't have time to fight over the last crumbs of supper when the most momentous thing to happen in the century up to this point is taking place. How about we get in the right battle? How about we get in the right fight? How about we get about our father's business? Hallelujah. There's nothing better than getting your hands in the air and casting down imaginations. There's nothing better than lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. There's nothing better than getting into this thing with all of your heart, mind, and soul. Contending for the souls of men. Contending for the souls of the lost. Hallelujah. The weapons of our warfare. The church's warfare is not like the world's warfare. Um, Peter, not understanding this, pulled a sword out and was ready to defend the way he had always been taught to defend. A few moments later, Malchus's ear is laying on the ground and Peter's looking around trying to figure out who wants some more. And Jesus had to inform Uh, Peter, if my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight for it. My kingdom is not of this world. As a matter of fact, the the stuff of this world is an inferior product. I'm not building a kingdom made with swords and spears and shields. Uh -uh, At least not the kind of swords you're thinking about. Amen. I'm not here to just chop somebody down. I'm here to save their soul. He looked at them one day and he said, the son of man didn't come to destroy life. He came to save life. He had to look at some young men one day who were a little overzealous and said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. I'll have to admit, there have been some times where the flesh wanted to take over when I got in some spiritual battles. Some people did me wrong. Some people said some things. People have done things before. And it's hard not to fall into the flesh. It's a good thing that I'm not Jesus on the cross. I've always struggled with people who taunt, people who mock. And Jesus had the strength and the power to stay on that cross when he could have come off. If it had been me, it may have been a little different. (laughs) Come off that cross. Oh, yeah, you want somebody? (laughs) I'm afraid that the flesh (laughs) being as weak as it is and the foolishness of human pride and the limited scope of winning the short-term battle right now jesus wasn't looking at defeating those people who were laughing at him he was looking at saving their kids and their grandkids and their great-grandkids he was looking two millennia down the road 
to a, a building here in Birmingham, Alabama, where people needed to be set free from bigger devils. If I come off of this cross, they won't have the blood. If I come off of this cross, they won't have the spirit. If I come off of this cross, they can't be redeemed. So I'm going to stay right here. Father, forgive them for they don't even know what they do. I'm fighting principalities. I'm fighting powers that you can't even imagine. I'm entering into the cosmics and I'm overcoming devils that have generational curses that have held you bound. Now, I'm not trying to defeat your cousin Eddie that's talking bad about me. I'm trying to defeat devils. I'm trying to defeat spiritual principalities that are so real. I'm going to raise up a people that look past the person and see the devil destroying that person. Hallelujah. Peter, coming up with the best of intentions, looked at him and said, far be it from you, Jesus. We're never going to let you die. We're going to never let you die. We got to keep you here with us. The self-serving nature, the carnal nature, the, the wanting, the here and now, the finite, the temporary. It reared up and, 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 and Jesus looked at him and rebuked him. But he didn't fall into the trap that so many of us fall into. We focus on the person, not the devil speaking out of the person. If you want to waste your time, hate the person but if you want to get something done recognize the spirit that motivates the person Jesus looked at him and said that's not your voice Peter that's not the same man that had the revelation of the mighty God in Christ that's a different boy I recognize that devil behind there get thee behind me Satan for thou savorest the things that be of men not the things that be of God I recognize the devil behind the scenes and that's who I'm going after God has weapons that are designed to win battles over centuries. When, when, when the armies of this world, when their swords have rusted, my brother just recently went to Israel, and when he went to Israel, they, he actually snorkeled in the Red Sea. I didn't know they even had something like that. Snorkeling, that, that just destroys the mystique somehow for me. I don't, I don't want to think of people snorkeling. <laughs> I want to think of Moses, you know, parting it. You know, I don't want to think of people, the Smiths snorkeling in it. And when he was down there, the first thing I asked him was, did you see a chariot wheel? Did you see a rusty halberd? Did you see a skeleton arm sticking up out of the bottom? What, what, what did you see? You know, I think all that stuff had gone the way of all the earth a long time ago. But I'm trying to say that, that when, 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 when kingdom walls have long since dried up, dried up, blown away, long ago they've become hills covered over with sand. Long ago their dreams, their hatreds. Let me tell you something. It is a waste of time to hate because when you die, your hatred dies with you. I, I, I have no time to invest in those kinds of dead in roads. I must be about my father's business. When the kingdoms of this world have been sandblasted off the pages of time, Jesus Christ still has a kingdom. Not made with brick and mortar, but made with the souls of men and women I don't have time for that kingdom I got a bigger kingdom in mind hallelujah nobody cares about Napoleon anymore nobody cares about Hitler anymore except some ninth grade history student that's going to have a test on it next week nobody cares about those men and their empires that they built but today Jesus Christ has millions of people that will say I will die for him today I spoke with him this morning he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own I I'm in love with him more now than I ever have been. His sword is a sword of the spirit. His shield is a shield of faith. You can be seated. What was the young lady's name? Was it? Shush. With an N. Sanethia. 
Sanithia. What a beautiful young lady. What a beautiful spirit. It brings tears to my eyes to see there, there are strong devils that look at people and say, you're never going to make it. They stand in front of those who would try to make it and say, you will not make it. Your family didn't make it. Your mother didn't make it. Your father, your grandparents, they didn't make it. And they snarl and they spit discouragement at people that would try to make it. Oh, somebody hear what I'm saying. When the prophet tried to describe it, he said that the fathers have eaten a sour grape and the children's teeth are set on edge. What it means is what my father did will be will be transferred down to me and they're going to expose me to things and they're, I'm going to see things and the stuff they did they ate the grape but I feel the teeth set on edge from the tanginess and the tartness of what they did and the prophet was trying to say that there are things passed down from father to son and son to son and mother to daughter to where the cycle is so vicious and I, it breaks my heart as a preacher as a pastor to watch ambition get silent Silenced and to watch hope get extinguished underneath devils that would rend and tear and destroy. And when I see somebody grab a hold of a sword of the spirit and say, you might have got them, but you're not going to get me. When, when a man of God steps in front of a child of God and says, you're going to have to get her over my dead body. You're going to have to get her over my Thank God for a church that stands up and say, we'll fight those devils. Thank God for a brother that stands up and says, I'm not going to let them get you. Thank God for somebody that knows how to get involved in the right battle and the right warfare. This is the kingdom of God. This is the church. Praise the Lord. I'm glad to be a part of the church of the living God. The weapons of the church work. They work. I don't care what the devil says. They work. Amen. Somebody said, Pastor Urshan, this is back home. Pastor Urshan, man, things are bad. Everything's going wrong. And, and, and yet at the same time, people are getting the Holy Ghost left and right. <laughs> baptismal waters are being stirred every single week several times a week and my god it feels like we're all about to be destroyed this popped up that popped up there's satanic attacks all over the place i got a big smile on my face in the middle of my trial and i said there's some powers there's some principalities in this city that are starting to shake in their boots there are some spirits of false doctrine that have held people captive for a long time you better get ready devil of heresy because there's a Jesus name church marching down the highway we know what his name is we know he's the father and we know he's the son and we know he's the Holy Ghost and all these three are one I know he's the alpha and I know he's the omega and when I get baptized we baptize in Jesus name we know it we know it we know it we're going to open up the prison doors to everybody you've lied to amen we know the blood of Jesus operates through the power of the name of Jesus we know that the Holy Ghost is real the devil don't want to hear that the devil don't want to hear that there's people that know the Holy Ghost is real he wants to mock you into silence he wants to intimidate you and back you up into a corner but when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues somebody's got to stand up and say I've already been there I've already ta oh taste and see that the Lord is good I've already had a drink of that water Somebody say amen. amen. You can be seated. Now some folks are uncomfortable with these kinds of weapons because, well, let me tell you what the weapons are. I mean, the word of God. Prayer. Faith. Preaching. 
These are our weapons. Hallelujah. I don't, don't fall into the trap of thinking talking bad about somebody is a weapon we would stoop to using. Sarcasm is not in the arsenal of the child of God. Backbiting, coming back, giving back what was given to you in like manner is not part of the battle strategy of the child of God. Gee, and, and you got to be careful because when you hear this kind of talk, you know, the devil will tell you that's weakness. Mercy is weakness. Long suffering is weakness. You can't do anything. Listen, listen, I have learned that God's arm reaches further than my arm. God knows how to get somebody back better than I know how to get them back. God knows how to balance the scales. Amen. The weapons of our warfare are powerful weapons. And I want to bring a message to the church tonight. Have confidence in your weapons. You are a part of a group of people that have represented God on earth. And when, whenever God is ready to go to battle, he goes to battle different than the way man goes to battle. When God passes out his weapons, he doesn't give bazookas and flamethrowers and tanks, stealth bombers. He gives them smooth stones. He gives them jawbones. He gives them trumpets. He gives them candles. He gives them pictures to put the candle in. <laughs> he gives them these kind of weapons. When, when his warriors line up and he hands out, okay, here's a trumpet for you, here's a trumpet for you, and for you. And they look at their weapons. There's a few things that God is accomplishing here. The first thing that God is accomplishing is that glory belongs to God. God's going to get some glory out of this thing. At the end, of, listen, here's something that I feel. I, somebody came to me and said, Pastor Urshan, I am so pathetic. I am so, I, why would God ever take time with me? Why would God ever look at me? I said, you are a perfect candidate for serving the Lord. Because you know that you have nothing. Therefore, that means he's everything. That, that this is why the talented and the wealthy and the good looking and, 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 and the powerful and the movers and shakers, this is why they can't get anything done. And if they do, it lasts for 50 years and then nobody remembers it anymore. But, but God raises up shepherds. He raises up people who can't speak straight. He, he raises up people that are hiding, uh, threshing wheat in a, in a secret place. He raises up virgins that everybody's going to laugh at. He raises up people of low origins that when God gets done with them, them when God gets finished with that battle nobody's going to say glory be to so and so he's going to say glory be to God if God can use you God can do anything when they get done with this thing they're going to say thank you Lord thank you Lord they're not going to be looking at you they're going to be looking at him well I don't have anything that's all right you bring your little well, all I have is a couple fish and a couple loaves of bread. You bring it on in here. That's a perfect setting for God to do something great. When we're finished with this thing, people are going to say, glory to God. When we get done, see, we, 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 want, we want big numbers. We want lots of firepower. I want to know I got more guys than, than they got. And so they brought about 10,000 soldiers in, and, and Gideon thought, oh boy, here we go. Okay, all right. We might have a fighting chance here. We might, I don't know, maybe we can pull this thing off. We're still outnumbered, but, you know, God's on our side. And God looked at him and said, I think you got too many. And so, okay, all right, well, what are we going to do? We'll tell everybody that's scared, go home. You don't want to do that. Everybody's scared. <laughs> Over half his army walks away. Oh, God! And, and the whittling down 
of natural strength paralyzes men and women. Okay, what, what are you doing? Are you trying to kill me? I, I'm boiling out of you self-sufficiency. I'm boiling out of you arrogance. I'm boiling out of you pride. And I'm putting inside of you faith. And I'm putting inside of you hope. Brother, that's all you got is hope. You better hope God knows what he's doing. So... Blossoming faith says, all right, well, we got a little hand for here. Maybe we, I don't, maybe God can work a miracle. And they start marching. God says, you still got too many. How much more pure can I get? How much? Tell everybody to drink. Everybody that drinks this way, go home. Everybody that doesn't, that's what we want. 300 men left over. God specializes in using the minority. Be very careful when you are attracted to the majority. If you're attracted to the majority, the odds are that human power and human intellect and talent and, and, and popular acclaim are the things that you look to. But people that look to truth often find themselves in the minority. Read it in your Bible. The Bible says that there were eight people that got on the ark when Noah built the ark. If, if you're looking for popularity, you're not going to get on the boats that God builds. But if you're looking for the truth, it doesn't matter how small, it doesn't matter how challenged, you're going to say, I'd rather be right and small than wrong and big my faith isn't in man my faith is in God if you're looking for the majority the odds are you're on the Broadway you're on the path that leads to destruction a well trampled path and the majority goes there but the way to life is narrow the gate is straight and few that's what he said few there be that find it so you're going to find out 500 saw him ascend but only 120 went on the day of Pentecost 12 walked into the land of Canaan but only 2 came back and said God is able hundreds heard Jesus preach but at the end of the day only 12 were left standing there and Peter said where will we go thou hast the words of eternal life I'm telling you if you want the majority get ready for hell but if you want what is right God is going to prepare you God is going to whittle you down God is going to And God's going to give you weapons that glorify him and minimize me. It never was about my strength. It never was about my glory. It never was about my power. If it was, it would be of this world. It would be the, it would be the weapons of their warfare. So pass out trumpets. Pass out candles, pass out pictures, and now we're going to fight. This is what we get. <laughs> when you come into God's kingdom, you're going to find out that his weapons are more than enough to get the job done. I sometimes I look at what God does and I chuckle to myself, thinking, God, you are great. Lord, you are great. You, you bring down the proud and you lift up the lowly. You exalt those that are low esteemed and, and you bring down those that exalt themselves and sit in high places. And at the end of the day, we all say, glory be to God. Glory, 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 glory be to God. I need to get comfortable with the things that God gives to me. I, what do you mean, uh, Brother Urshan? Let me, let, me, let me take a second. I believe in God's weapons. I believe in preaching. You are living in a world that laughs at preaching. The same spirit that came on Goliath and said, what am I, a dog, that you would send me this adversary? That same spirit is in the world that looks at the church and looks at preaching and says, that'll never work, that'll never help. It, the children that go into universities find themselves confronted with secularism and with evolution and, and with humanism that laughs and, and, and raises psychology as though it's the biggest answer and knowledge is the highest thing that we can have. And they look down on preaching and worship and glorifying God. But I'm going to tell you that giants don't fall by strength of arm. Giants fall by anointed men of God that say God can 
can, God can, God can, God can. It never was about my arm. It never was about my aim. It always was about him. And the sooner I figure out, the better I'm going to be. God's people don't win battles of their own volition and their own accord. Whew. There's nothing like preaching when it gets moving. Preaching is not the dissemination of knowledge. It has knowledge, but that's not its ultimate purpose. If you want that, go get a professor. Go get a lecture. Knowledge, it only goes so far. It only goes so far. What we have here has knowledge, but it's greater than knowledge. The Bible says that we can know the love of God. And this is a Bible phrase. It says it passeth knowledge. Hallelujah. The peace of God that passeth understanding. Preaching is a supernatural event. When a man gets behind a sacred desk, opens up a sacred book, and takes anointed words, and God pours into his mind things that no man could ever know. You think he's been looking in your front window. You think he heard that argument that you had last night. That man doesn't know your business. God knows your business. And he sends somebody at a time and a place to a flaming evangelistic word will jump from person to person to person and will reveal your thoughts and will make you confront yourself and will grab a hold of generational devils and shake them Hallelujah. It will rebuke the fornicator. It will rebuke those that would live in sin. It will encourage those that are downtrodden and those that are weak in mind. Preaching will re The Bible says that God chose by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. I can get up and I can pontificate and lecturize. That's not a word. But it works. I can get up here and I can talk about stuff with knowledge, but there's stuff I don't know. Oh, but I can open up my mind to the Holy Ghost and I can say, Jesus, take what I know and put it with what you know and save somebody. I'm going to shout it. I'm going to scream it. I'm going to proclaim it. I'm going to preach the fear off of somebody. I'm going to preach the depression off somebody. I'm going to preach the lust off of somebody. I'm going to preach the bitterness out of somebody. The Holy Ghost is going to reach in and grab a hold of you. It goes deeper than your knowledge. It transcends what you know. Man, somebody's been talking to that pastor. He just knows my business. I love it when evangelists come in and don't know anything. Because I got a little section in my church that always thinks that I'm telling people what to say. It's the doubtful. It's the hard-headed. Yeah, y all, y all, I know y'all don't have any of them here in Birmingham, but we got them in Florida. And they sit there with arms folded. And, 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 and I remember not too long ago we had a, a preacher come in. Matter of fact, I think it was Brother Cody Marks. He came in screaming off of an airplane, had 30 seconds before church, came dive bombing into my platform, and under the unction of the Holy Ghost began to say things that I didn't even know. And person after person after person, God began to deal with their heart. There is no lecture that can do that. It's a supernatural event. The Bible says that the unbeliever will come in and the thoughts of their heart will be revealed and they will fall upon their face and they will confess that God is in you of a truth. When they hear the word of God, God, that's not the word of that man. That's the word of God because the man can't know. The spirit of prophecy is a powerful thing. Ah, it'll crack open the toughest nut. And I got some nuts in my church. But when that spirit of prophecy comes forth, the thoughts of their heart, the secret ruminations in the dark of the night, 
the darkest of feelings come to light and God says I see you you think you can hide from me you can't hide from me I see exactly where you are I know where you are and I'm going to reach you I'm going to move past those devils I'm going to move past those spirits I'm going to move past your own hard headedness I feel good in the Holy Ghost right now. Let me tell you about some of our weapons. Some people think our weapons are weak. I need to tell you a little bit about mercy and long suffering. Oh, I'm not me. See, there's something about hatred. Hatred, hatred is a false strength. It's a fake strength. It's, it's a feeling and it's a, a, a dwelling of the mind on something somebody did or some event that happened. And you'll think about it. Just thinking about it can make you break out in a sweat. Sweat break out on your upper lip. If I ever see him again. If I ever find, if I ever find him. And it's no laughing matter because there are events that can happen. And, and as you're thinking it, you think you're hurting them. But you're not. You're hurting you. As you tear. The scripture gives a description of it. It says there was a man named Legion who walked among the tombs. And the Bible says that he cried. And here's what it said. It said he cut himself. Cutting himself among the tombs. Reliving something. I don't know what he relived. But he, he was reliving something. And spirits tearing at his mind. I'm telling you regret and resentment resentment the word scent comes from sentient it comes it means to 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 relive to think again to relive again to go through it again i don't want to go through it again i'm not holding them in jail they're holding me in jail the memory of them that kind of a hatred tears and it rips and it, and it pulls at my heart and at my spirit i need to tell somebody about the peace and the mercy that god knows how to bring to a tortured mind listen when you learn to forgive your brother or your sister you're not letting them go you're letting yourself go Jesus came and he said I got something new for you guys I want you when somebody steals something from you I want you to give them more and when they slap you turn the other cheek and when they take your cloak give them your garment also and when they and people said, what? As we gear up for our war, as we gear up for what life has taught us, and we get ready to fight. But then he gave the reason why. He said, because the sun rises on the just and on the unjust. And he gives rain to the just and to the unjust. What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm saying if you're going to be a child of that God, you better thank God he let the sun rise on you. Me? What do I have to do with anything? God's mercy is the kind of mercy that he lets you work through your hard-headedness. He didn't destroy you the first time that you did something wrong. He didn't, tear, he didn't cause the rain to stop falling the first time you made a mistake. But he let him, by his mercy and by his grace and by his long suffering, he let you keep on breathing air. And he let you keep on rising. Wicked though we are, he lets me walk into a new day. Wicked though I am, he lets the rain keep falling on me. And if you're going to be my son, and if you're going to be my daughter, then you're going to have to do it too. couple things I'm going to teach you through this number one mercy works mercy how's mercy work well you're here aren't you Is, am I the only one that, that when I come in this place, I don't feel like I'm worthy to walk in here? But I say, thank you, Jesus, you didn't kill me the first time. Thank you, Jesus, you had mercy on me. Thank you, Jesus, you let me live when I was doing wrong, when I was saying it wrong, when I was living it wrong. You came anyway. You loved me anyway. You let me come back to church. You sent the preacher to my house. You kept my Bible study going. You let me come back to the altar. Ah! 
Am I the only one? I had some stuff to outgrow. I had some, I had some maturing to do. And God saved me in my ignorance. And God saved me in my hard headedness. And God saved me when I didn't know any better. I didn't know what I was saying. I didn't know what I was thinking. But your long suffering. So while I'm wrong, I still come in. I raise my hands. And he says, I got grace for you. I'll pour out my spirit upon you. There's some folks in here. They get mad when God touches somebody else with the Holy Ghost. Because you're mad at them. Don't ever be like that. Because he could have did it to me. And I'm glad he didn't. I'm glad he kept his hand on me. And he watched over me. And he... The mercies of God are powerful weapons. They melt hard-heartedness. They melt. They can melt bitterness. They can melt hatred. They can melt all kinds of unclean things. The constant exposure to the Holy Ghost. There is such a thing as an incremental opening to God. There is such a thing as a softening to God. Hallelujah. Service by service. God's doing something good in my life. Please give me time. Please give me time. Please don't judge me too soon. Because if you judge me, and you may be right. That's the scary part. You may be, maybe I am an idiot. Maybe I am terrible, but please give me time for God to work on me. Please give me time for God to give me a new heart and for me to see things. Please don't kill me. Please don't kill Saul before it becomes Paul. I can focus on my short-lived, short-sighted personal battle or I can look at the kingdom of God and I can say this thing bridges the cosmos and I want you to have your way Jesus I feel the Holy Ghost right now powerful weapons the weapons of our warfare they're not carnal Whew. praise the Lord Can I have a couple more minutes? The word of God is a powerful weapon. I want to. I'd like to talk about this for a second, if that's all right. I'll just just shout me down if you think I'm going too long. I am not afraid of obedience. I'm not afraid of it. We live in a world where obedience is a bad word. We live in a world where obedience is linked up with cult behavior. We live in a world where people will look at you and say, you just do anything that man says, won't you? You do anything that Bible says. That Bible's 5,000 years old and you'll just do whatever it says. And, 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 and there's a mockery and there's a condescension and there's an attack. This is what we call a postmodernist society. That's where they tear down every bit of structure that there ever was. And they say that there is no truth. But I'm here to tell somebody the word of God is true. The word of God. The older I get and the more time passes, I am amazed at how true the word of the Lord is. You go ahead and go to that university, but don't you ever put down your Bible. You go ahead and you learn about Friedrich Nietzsche and you learn about Freud and you learn about all that stuff. But don't you ever forget your father is Abraham and David was a worshiper. And the day of Pentecost is what it's all about. You can go ahead and learn about all that stuff, but it don't matter... It doesn't amount to a heel of beans next to the apostles and the prophets. I have figured out that the word of God is true and I'm not ashamed to obey. We live in a world that everybody's from Missouri. They always got to say, show me, show me. 
But there, I, I, listen here. They'll, they'll say that people have faith. They're superstitious. They're ignorant. They're, you know, they got two teeth in their head and they carry a Bible. That's what they say. And, and shouting hallelujah and running around the church. And like there's some kind of a. <laughs> so. So this world, it comes against the things of God. It comes against the spirit of God. It comes against the word of God. But I'm going to stand up boldly and say God's word is true. God's word. Having faith doesn't mean I'm ignorant. It doesn't mean I'm dumb. It doesn't mean I was born in a barn somewhere. I'm not a hillbilly. I'm not superstitious. I, I haven't lost my mind. Yes, I speak in tongues. Yes, I believe in God. Yes, I pray. But it doesn't mean I've lost my mind. Let me tell you what it does mean. It means I'm smart enough to know I don't know everything. It means I'm smart enough to know that God is great and is greatly to be praised. It means that I see enough to know that God made it. God created. His fingerprints are on everything. I see the handicraftsmanship of a designer. Faith isn't the domain of the ignorant. It's the domain of people that say man can go this far and then God takes over. Can I have a couple more minutes? There are some things we don't know. And we still don't know. Can you imagine living in the Old Testament when God told them don't eat this And he didn't tell him why. He just said, don't eat this. Why? It's unclean. What does that mean? <laughs> Men and women of God had to stop and say, I will obey. Even though I don't know why. Looking back now from the year 2012, it's looking at a level of ignorance, a lack of development. They didn't have science textbooks. They, nobody could have come and said, well, the shrimp is a scavenger that eats all the contaminants in the ocean. And, and there are uh, uh, detritus and there is garbage and there is decayed matter and degenerative matter. And it all collects along the bottom. And God made shrimp and lobsters to go and to, to devour that. And it's the garbage of the sea. And when they eat the garbage and you eat it, then you eat the garbage. <laughs> Man in that state would say, huh? There is such a thing as knowing that God knows. And I may not know. And I'm okay with that. That's where obedience steps in. I I, I can remember a time where where my children were at a point in their life where they didn't understand everything. And the way I communicated with them wouldn't be the way I would communicate with a fully functioning mature adult. I can say, honey, don't touch the stove. Two years of age. Why? Now, I can sit there and I can say, well, because when I click this uh, knob, then electrons are freed to go around the coil and, ele- and, and electrical current and ions transfer energy positive to negative. And it goes around that coil until heat is generated. And in that generation, the temperature raises. And when that happens, it can damage the tissue of anything that might come into contact with it. <laughs> the two to three year old. <sighs> you folks get the picture, right? So, so using the language of parents around the world, I put my face right in front of that little face and I said, see if you figure this out. No touchy. You touchy, I breaky. 
Okay, I got that. I got that. You might not know it, but sometimes you just got to obey it. There are some things I don't know, but when my father steps in and says, just don't go there, just don't touch it, there are things working that you know nothing about. Obey, obey, obey. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding, but in all thy ways. Acknowledge him. Oh, not me. I got to figure it out. There's some stuff you can't figure out. Praise God. Look at how far forward in the future obedience launched them. They lived longer. They had more children. Listen, when they outnumbered Egypt, it wasn't an accident. It was because the life expectancy of Egypt was low and the Hebrews were high. We don't eat it. We don't touch it. We don't. We know about hygiene before anybody even knew a germ existed. I didn't have to know what was going on. I just knew don't touch it. Don't go in there. Don't be a part of it. The Hebrew boys walked into that Babylonian feast and said, we don't want any of that stuff. Why? I don't know. We just don't. I'm telling you, obedience will catapult you into the future when it's about God's business. It's about God's business. I'm I'm not talking about mindless obedience. I'm talking about obedience to the word of God. I'm talking about anointed. Listen, Red Seas were never parted by knowledge. If you're, if, you're, if you're set on figuring everything out, when you get up to the Red Sea, you're going to be trying to figure that out. Sometimes you just got to obey the Lord and let him part the Red Seas of your life and trust in him. And obedience can do it when nothing else can. I don't know how bread falls from heaven. I don't know how water comes out of rocks. I don't know how ravens bring bread to a prophet in the wilderness. I don't know how it happens. All I know is I obey his word. I I, I know we're so sophisticated any longer that people see think that faith is silly. But faith is a powerful weapon. The Bible says it's a it's a shield. Hallelujah. I'm not going to preach it longer. You can stand with me here tonight. But I, I had people look at me when I went to start my church and they said, Brother Urshan, how are you going to start that church? You don't have any music. You don't have any people. All you have is your wife and your little baby. How are you going? There's no way to do it. You, you, you need to go to college and get a degree before you do it. You need to learn how to play the piano before you do it. You need to, you need to get some people that you know. You, you, you need to do this and you need to do that. And all they kept saying... All these things, all these reasons why I couldn't do it. And did you know that it is possible to talk yourself out of something before you start? But when you get faith and when you believe in God and when you have the blessing of the man of God and things are in line with the will of God and you are God called and God sent, there is not a devil in hell that can stop you. I, 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 my, my pastor said, all right, we're going to go. We're going to plant this church over here. We're going to do this and we're going to do that. And I kept saying, how? I don't have any money. How? I, when I say I didn't have money, folks, I mean, I didn't have money. I was broke. 22 years old and broke. We're going to build a church. How? I mean, yeah, uh, faith, okay, faith, faith. What, uh, faith, that's fine for Sunday. But what happens when I got to pay my bills? What happens... When my children got to have groceries. What happens when somebody gets sick? What happens when the rent comes due? How? How? Finally, he said, do you have any Indian in you? How? 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 I do not have time to tell you every detail. But I can tell you that when I needed groceries and I had nothing, I walked to my mailbox and I found $50. I can tell you that as my car was sputtering out of gas, I had nothing to, to spend. And I figured, you know what? I pull up at a, ga- out there, a gas station sitting right there. I said, I'll break down right there. What better place to break down than a gas station? I'll wire my parents. Maybe they can, you know, two days from now, I'll get some cash. I opened my door and stepped on a $20 bill.
I know that doesn't sound like a lot to some people, but to a broke 22-year-old. I started speaking in tongues right there in my car. God bumped up the scale a little bit. Church grew a little bit. And, and my wife was, 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 and I, we both, we were wanting to go to a conference and we were lonely. We didn't have anybody in the city. We didn't know what was going on. Any husband here that's ever had a wife and, and yourself, and you know you're lonely, your kids need some fellowship, your wife would like some fellowship, and we would like to go to a certain conference. We were so broke we could not go to that conference and we just resigned ourselves to stay in home and we'll just go next year and save our little pennies and figure it out. We'll go the next time. I opened up the front door door yes and folks may not believe this that's all right you don't have to believe it i was there i opened up the front door and 500 otters fluttered down to the ground how how i can't tell you the emotional and spiritual lift god gave me on that day but he didn't stop there we went to purchase property i needed hundred and twenty thousand dollars and i didn't have anything can i tell you that within seven days time we faith we, we fasted we prayed god gave hundred and twenty thousand dollars and we used it as a down payment to purchase a multi-million dollar piece of property and that little indiana boy that sat there going how 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 god was saying let me show you let me show you let me show you you bring me your fish you you bring me your loaves I'll multiply it I'm talking about weapons that are beyond your imagination somebody's got to step out of the boat and let God do some things somebody's got to believe in what we've got I believe in preaching I believe in prayer I believe in worship I believe in the church I believe in my pastor I believe in speaking in tongues I believe Oh, somebody lift your hands.